10, 9, ignition, ignition sequence start. start. All engines are running. The clock is over. The clock is over. The clock is over. Our big leap continues as well, right into episode 6, Kerbalcast, Return of the Kerbi. That name no longer has any meaning for me. I am your LMP, that's Lunar Module Pilot, Biff Aldrin, and with us our CMP, Command Module Pilot, Nostromo. Coming up in today's program, we look at our individual progress in the progress report. We have a tribute to one very special listener. We read letters from our listeners in the crew report. And we'll get you up to date on the latest Kerbal Space News. And an episode of As As the the Kerbin Kerbin Turns. Turns. We also talk about the movie Solaris in our digress segment. Well, thanks to our uh, episode title, I now know what the plural of Kerbal is. For like more than one? Yeah, Kerbi. Kerbi. Yeah, it's, it's one Kerbal and then... Two kerbi. Okay, so... Or, or more. Two or more kerbi. So what do you call, like, a group of them? Like, there's, like, a herd like, of cattle. Yeah, like a herd of kerbi. A kerbi herd. A kerbi herd. Or a gaggle of kerbi. I'm going to call it a crash of kerbi. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of crashing kerbi, um, as always, let's go ahead and do our progress report. Uh, you've been at this for about two months now. I've, I've actually, uh, I've upped your clock a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking about a month and a half, somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, well, I, I had, was, I was rounding it up to make you sound better. Oh, okay. You sound, <laughs> sound professional. <laughs> I want to impress the chicks. We're already, don't, yeah, don't overestimate me. It's not going to be impressive. Um, <laughs> I could say that I, I didn't have a whole lot of hours last week. I was able to get quite a few in this week. So I was trying to, trying to make up for lost time. So the main thing I've been working on is what I've been working on the past two weeks is i've been trying to get rendezvous down and i'm getting i'm getting really really close so the big r yeah the big the big r the big so, r <laughs> i you know i'm making two identical craft launching them whenever they're close to the same you know the launch in the second one was close to the same orbit and uh i started running into a new problem uh the original problem was i just didn't know what i was doing the new problem is I uh, still don't know what I'm doing. And <laughs> uh, while they were up there, I'd make an adjustment here, make an adjustment there. I was switching between crafts. And then I would, you know, I would need to get them to get closer to each other. And right. one's at a larger orbit, so I need to get the one in the shorter orbit to catch up. And, like, they were crossing at points. So I would fast forward. Well, I left on something. I left I left the, the light on in the living room <laughs> or something. And so by the time I got to them, they'd both completely died. Like, You're talking about their batteries were yeah, dead. Yeah, the batteries are dead. And okay. I covered these things in batteries. It was a flying battery. And I was I Do you have solar panels? I don't I don't have them yet. Okay. So Yeah, cuz no matter how many batteries you have, I mean, you can run them out if you're not replenishing them. Yeah, see whenever whenever I originally had the campaign going, I I got the solar panels. This time I got something else. I think I got the upgrade below it, which I don't even remember what I got it for. Like it, it, gave, it gave me something else. It, oh, it gave me the thermometer. <laughs> you don't have to be specific. Yeah, it gave me it gave me the thermometer. <laughs> okay. Because I thought the thermometer was going to get me a whole bunch of science, which right. is going to catch me up to the panels, and it really doesn't. Right. It doesn't give out a whole lot of science. It's like you know, it's like croutons on the salad of science. <laughs> They're nice, and you always appreciate them, and you wish you had more, but they, you just get what you get. Ah, uh, the the long sought after Kerbal salad connection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, you know what just tickled me though was about midweek. I got that text from you. Do you remember? Yeah. You sent me this text and it said, "It said, yeah, um, yeah, I remember that." Yeah, it was. Uh, um, you said, "Do they have to be going the same direction in orbit?" Yeah, and I was like, "Well, not you know, if you're just wanting to wave as you pass." <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Are you trying to run him? <laughs> I did it, and like they were so close, it was crazy. It's probably the closest I had been, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, I need to get him to sync up, and I and I fast, you know, hit the time warp right. like super high, and Let's they're going in opposite do directions. The time warp, again. and they're like they're like crossing over, and they just keep passing each other, and I was like, oh, they're going the opposite direction. And, and then I was like, how much would it take to go to make one of them turn around? Not as much as like as it would fuel be like, you had, yeah. yeah. and it would be a lot easier. To just revert the whole thing and be like, yeah. okay, never mind. Well, it's it's like I said, you can you can rendezvous from any starting point, but it's all a question of what's the most fuel efficient. Yeah, um, and you know, reversing the direction of your orbit burns up a heck of a lot of fuel. Yeah, it 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 was going to take a lot. Yeah. So I was like, well, it's probably just a smarter idea to just restart it. But it sounds like it sounds like you're doing exactly the same thing I did, which was. 
you get real close to rendezvous and then you run out of fuel. Yeah. And then you restart. Yeah, I was either running out of fuel or I was running out of uh, energy because I was using probes, not capsules. Right. right. You know, I, I, I was mainly doing it for so I didn't feel bad about killing or straining Kerbals in space. Mm hmm. But I, I think it was actually it weighed less because I tried doing it with capsules and it like it threw it threw my weight off some and it's like equilibrium and then I realized I took off the reaction wheels when I took off the right. those and so I'm I'm going back to using probes. It's you know I, what I think is is so cool about this game that I mean it seems like a lark at first the fact that all the Kerbals have names but if you notice how you kind of have like this personal attachment, like you don't want to kill Jebediah and you don't want to kill Bob and yeah. Bill. And it's like, how many Call of Duty players out there are going, oh no, I killed, you know, yeah, Jeffrey. X. Yeah, I killed Jeff. Oh, not Jeffrey. <laughs> he was too young. Yeah. I struck him down in the prime of his. It's like nobody does that. Yeah. But in Kerbal, it's like people go, you know, oh, I don't want to strand. And I do that. Like, I only use uh, Dude Goss. Yeah. For, like, the big missions. Mm -hmm. Even though he, you know, his stupidity is really high and his courage is really <laughs> low, I just, the name. I got to send Dude Goss into space. Well, I have a feeling, honestly, the stupidity has to be real high before they'll get anywhere near the rockets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's got to be a level of that. I have one that's, like, almost no stupidity and all courage, and I haven't sent him on anything. And at first I thought maybe it's because I saw, saw him as valuable, mm -hmm. but it's probably, like, he's, you know, subliminally, like, dissuading me from using it yeah. well i just you know the fact that they have the names and that we kind of do get somewhat you know a little yeah. attached to them yeah i mean that's why if um um earlier when i was playing the game if i ran out of fuel and uh and i would have a craft that would be stranded in like curve and orbit uh -huh. instead of just killing the craft and you know losing those crew members for a yeah. couple of days i always mounted a rescue mission yeah, see, I, I would revert because I'm not at the point where I could rescue somebody. Yeah, yeah. So. it's, uh, again, going back to Call of Duty. I mean, I can't imagine a bunch of guys going, hey, we got to go back and get Bob. Yeah, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's stranded out there. So, like, yeah, any anytime I see one stranded, I was like, I can't leave him like that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm like the Kerbal Convention, mm -hmm. you know, like made, made rules of, you know, he, Kerbal humanity. I, um, um, in, in my learning progression with Rendezvous, um, before I could actually get them close enough to dock, yeah. what I would do is I would get them close enough to where I could EVA. And oh, that, and yeah. you'd have them... And that was always fun, because, you know, a lot of times there'd be, the, like, this huge gap, and then, of course, I wasn't very good with the rocket pack initially, right? So he'd be, like, flying all over the place, and finally... That's, you know. Man, that is too nerve-wracking. I'm not oh, even yeah. going to... Oh, it was like the most de demented version of WALL-E you've ever seen. Uh-huh. But, you know, at first, it's like I'd go shooting past the other craft, and then I'd <laughs> go, like, you know, I'd get real close to it, and I'd go, okay, I need to be up a little bit, and I'd hit the up key, and next thing I know, I'm, like, way above it, and then oh, I'd yeah. come slamming down into it, and, you know, that's that was my primitive version of Rendezvous. <laughs> I, I'm not brave enough to do that yet. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> like... <laughs> I mean, okay, I'm going to try it. Okay, if if it if it happens and I'm and I'm not using probes, I'll, I'll try it. I still say I've said this before, but I will say it again. You are progressing in this game a lot faster than I ever did, well, and I, I I I think that's I think that's partly two things. I think number yeah. one, if there's a way to mess something up in a game, I will find it. Um, and and you know you you have a. Um, kind of a natural inclination for video games anyway and i think number two the fact that we're talking about this kind of helps you yeah the uh like all the discussion on it if i was yeah. just if i was to find the game like kind of in a bubble where i was just which is what myself, i did like i you know yeah i am not one to usually go to any sort of online resource on how to play stuff mm -hmm. unless it's like going for unlockables or achievements or anything i usually just try to figure it out yeah and uh it would have been a long time before i would have looked at anything on how to do stuff so it would have been hard to say, like, how much I would have stayed in the game, you know, without being, like, already, like... Right. I was into the, in, you know, because of becoming on the podcast, I was into the community before I was, like, barely into the game. Right. You know? So... Well, the one, the the interesting thing, I think, about Kerbal is, is that, for example, I, you know, I lost about a year of my life playing uh, Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Oh, okay, yeah. And, um, you know, like, I'd be at work during my lunch break, literally printing off tables that you know compared different weapon sets oh, yeah, like and you know yeah and stat and sheets and spells and i mean you know and I, it's like i would research these things like there were the dead sea uh -huh. scrolls but 
with with Kerbal, um, I was doing the same thing. You know, I would be on my lunch break, you know, going through all of this online stuff. But a lot of times I would, you know, it's like, okay, I want to learn about Rendezvous. And I'd go to the Rendezvous page, and there'd be all these formulas and all this terminology, and I'd be going, okay, I'm mm-hmm. lost. Never mind. Yeah. Uh, I'm just completely lost. And, and this was one of those games where I had to kind of figure it out in the game before I could go to the written online help and understand it yeah it wasn't because usually with games it's the other way around you know usually it's oh the secret entrance is behind the flower pot yeah like you you don't have to have some advanced knowledge of how to do anything in order to just like okay i can see them do it i just now need to get the practice of when to jump when to you know do this this one you actually have to have practical experience before you can actually sit down and read i mean and that's my experience I'm, i'm sure there's some yeah. wunderkind out there yeah. who, you know, like read read all the online stuff and never played the game, and you know, and then was like a class A player. Yeah, the, I, seeing all the formulas and stuff was pretty daunting. Well, I learned. Um, you were talking about trying to get science. I stumbled across something um, this past week that I had never done before, um, but it is a it's a real easy way of getting a whole bunch of science all at once. Okay, I'm all ears for this. <laughs> that thermometer's not paying off, and I need to get those solar panels. <laughs> well, you're not putting the thermometer in the right place. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you do is, um, you know how whenever you take off, um, you, you launch from, from Kerbin, and uh, at, at some point you begin your pitch over so that you can go into orbit, what you do instead of doing that, just burn straight off the ground and just keep going until you hit Kerbin escape velocity. And what I mean by that is you get enough speed going to where you bypass the moon or the mun and you bypass Minmus and you actually go into orbit around the sun. And what you do is the minute you peek your head out from Kerbin orbit, the minute you get into orbit around the sun, do all of your science right then, whatever you've got. Do your mystery goo, uh, do your science package, if you've got your thermometer, if you've got your gravioli detector, anything you've got, do it. Make sure you do your crew report. Um, make sure you EVA and do an EVA report and then get back in. Once you do this, and it should take you, you know, 30 seconds to do all of that. Once you do it, do a retro burn and be sure and look at your map when you do it. Do a retro burn, um, you will see a Kerbin encounter node pop up fairly quickly. And then what you do is you immediately kill your engine, and it doesn't take much fuel. And that's why I said do all this the minute you, you stick your head out. It doesn't take much fuel to get your Kerbin encounter node. Kill your engine, uh, do your time compression, get to that. Once you do that, it changes your orbit to kind of a, a semi straight line that's a little bit bent that has the periapsis right in the middle of it. That means that you've been captured by curb and gravity. But if you don't slow down, um, you will bypass curb and go right back out again. Uh Um, Keep your engine off, do your time compression, get to the periapsis, do another retro burn, and close the orbit. In other words, make a circle out of it instead of that, that bent line. And then just ride it to the periapsis, do another retro burn, and just keep doing that until you bring your orbit down close enough to the atmosphere of Kerbin, and then you can aero brake, and uh, and you can come in with fuel to spare. And when I did this, I ended up with I I think the number was approximately 700 science. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I mean it was just I mean it was literally it was straight out and straight back. Did you need any fancy gear or anything? And like you just said, you did it in career mode. Yeah, yeah, so- I did it in career mode, and all I had. Uh, if I remember correctly, because I've added some stuff since, but I had Mystery Goo, I had the Science Package. You know what that is. That's yeah, the, the Science yeah. Junior. The yeah. Little, yeah. Um, yeah, Science Junior, I should call it that. Um, Science Junior, I had a Thermometer, which if I remember correctly, when you try and do a temperature reading in space, it says you can't do that. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, I had the um, barometric pressure uh, gauge, which obviously doesn't work in space, no yeah. atmosphere. When I came back, and I... I um, I went into the science center to buy stuff, and what I did, instead of buying all the lower uh, rung stuff, I instead spent most of it on the heavy rocketry. Because once you get those heavy engines and once you get those big tanks, Uh that's when you can really get up into orbit and go places with fuel to spare. So anyway, that was a a tip I learned. Uh, If you want to get a lot of science all at once, go out into sun orbit very, very quickly and then come back. 
and make sure you run all your sun tests. Yeah, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to try it. Um, I also picked up another tip, and this one came to us from a listener. Uh, this is from Jim Patterson, and uh, we haven't gotten into crew report yet, but I want to go ahead and read his letter. Uh, he said, "You talked about running into a bug problem, uh, bug slash problem, where you quick saved and loaded while under parachutes." Do you remember I told you that was my uh, failed yeah, yeah, failed well, attempt to get a polar reading? It's, I mean, it's that ther- thermometer. It's how to well, get us. this is what I learned. Um, I had never known this. He says the result being that your ship loads without parachute and it plummets to your doom. Um, if you quick save after you've popped your parachutes off uh, and then quick load, you don't get your parachutes back. And that's that's what I was talking about. And he says, quote, I ran into this problem as well, but managed to, I love this, managed to reload again, EVA, repack the parachute, get back in, and deploy the parachute before crashing. That's like... That's like action movie stuff. That's like MacGyver. Yeah. You know, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I mean, and the, I could not have done that. Sim- well, two reasons. Number one, I was so close to the ground when I quick saved. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, uh, if I had tried to EVA, basically there would have been two splats instead of one. <laughs> um, and secondly, I'm assuming that he has got uh, ladders or hand grips on, on his capsule because if you try an EVA without that stuff, basically you step out of the cabin and then you, and you watch just, as it you fly off. Yeah, you watch as it flies away and you go, bye. Uh-huh. Um, he says it's not the mo- most realistic maneuver, but it was pretty badass. Um, the thing that I learned from this, because you notice he says, repack the parachute. Yeah. And so I emailed him and I said, how exactly do you repack the parachute? And he says, what you do is you have to get... Right, you know, you have to get your Kerbal real close to the parachute and right-click on it. Oh. And it was perfect because he's absolutely right. If you do that, I mean, it literally brings up a menu and it says repack parachute. And you click on it and you get your parachute. Oh, back. so I guess like anytime you accidentally fire off your parachute, yeah. like in staging, you just repack well, it. Well, what the reason, this is, this is extremely good timing. And thank you, Jim Patterson, for sending this in. And the reason I say it's good timing is this. Right now in the game, I'm trying to get to Duna. Duna is the in-game version of Mars, okay? Okay. Now, unlike Minmus and unlike the Mun, Duna has an atmosphere. It's a thin atmosphere, but it is enough to where you need to use your parachutes. Now, in the past, when I have gone to Duna, I have always had to pack, or not pack, I should say, I have always built craft that had two sets of parachutes, yeah. One that I could fire coming down on Duna, and then one I could fire coming back. Well, now I know that I can land on Duna, get out, repack the chutes, go back to Kerbin, and use them again. I'm trying something this time that I had never done before. Um, in the entire time that I've played the game, I'm trying to remember, because I know I've been to Duna before, and I know I've been to Eve. Which, by the way, Eve has a much thicker atmosphere than even Kerbin. Oh yeah, you don't. You cannot land with dinky engines on Eve. So is, you have to have a powerful engine to get back up. So, so does that mean like the Kerbals? Would that make their voice deeper? <laughs> it makes them sound like Darth Vader. No. Oh. Um, but what I'm trying to do in 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 the past when I've gone to Duna, I cannot remember for the life of me if I made a complete mission where I went there and came back and landed all with the fuel that I started with. Um, I'm thinking that what I had done was I probably got back close enough to curb and orbit where I would do rescue missions and then bring them down. Yeah. I think that's, I don't know that I've ever, I can't remember for sure if I've ever gone to Duna and come back on the fuel that I started with. Um, what I'm doing this time is I built, you know, I said, I, I, I got the heavy rocketry. Um, I built these like super tankers and I have made a string of them. Uh, there's one. There was one in Kerbin orbit, one yeah. in Mun orbit, one in Minmus orbit, and I'm currently in the process of putting one in Duna orbit. You're making like space trucker stops. Yeah, yeah, basically, you know, like the the you know the old time filler up and keep on a trucking cafe. Yeah. Um, there, I've I've got literally a string of them, and right now my uh, craft is in orbit around the Mun, where I have just refueled. Um, and I stopped there because I needed to put one in orbit around Minmus. And like I said, I'm in the process of putting one around Duna. 
But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get there and get back um, using the, the one craft all the way. So we'll see, we'll see how that works, but it's it's kind of cool that I can repack the chutes now, and yeah. also that I can refuel as yeah, I go. Yeah, it's gonna I don't know make it uh, more efficient as far as like the building and everything goes. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. So anything else as far as uh, what you're doing? Uh, no, I'm just gonna keep working on rendezvous, okay. and uh, I'm gonna try to do that science thing that you're talking about the the mission to the sun, and just, <laughs> and, uh, just circle that real quick just to cash in on you know. Have you ever seen uh, the movie Sunshine? Yes. Okay. Be beware the burnt up naked guy. Yeah. Well, I just I He's, always he has a really bad attitude. I keep that motto in my daily life and yeah. and murderous tendencies. Too. <laughs> what? Beware the burnt up naked. Yeah, guy? Oh yeah, yeah. You never you never be too certain. <laughs> you can usually find them around the beach. Okay, so our podcast gets downloaded pretty much all over the world. Yeah, yeah. we are um, the podcast service that we use uh, breaks it down by geography. Yeah, and we're not in every country, but we are pretty much on every continent. And uh, we're able to go through and, uh, and see which areas download us the most. And right at the very end of the list, there's just a handful of, uh, of like, areas. Yeah, like a couple one-offs. Yeah, where we have literally one listener. And we decided we wanted to do, uh, we just kind of picked one at random. Yeah, we're, and, gonna, we're yeah. gonna take you on an adventure there. <laughs> we wanted to thank the one listener because, you know, we know that you know, that this is like one of those awful secrets. Like if everybody else knew that you were listening to us, you'd probably be ostracized and, you know, chased home from school and beaten up and stuff. So we, we appreciate your courage listening to us. And so we want to thank our one listener in American Samoa. And uh, we want to thank you. And we want to kind of teach everybody a little bit. If you don't know about American Samoa, uh, we found this educational film, uh, and, and we want you to hear this. Picture for schools, take eight. Well, the music's nice. Oh, thanks. I mean, I didn't do it. American thanks. Samoa, <laughs> one of the loveliest spots in all the Pacific. A place of rare beauty, of constantly changing scenery, of happy people. There are five volcanic islands here, mountainous islands with a total area of 76 square miles. I'm sorry this is all in black and white. Oh, it's not just me? No. This is older than I thought. Where'd you get a projector? It came with a rental. You had to blow the dust off of it, though. Do they have to be gas-powered? Yeah. But there are two Samoas, American and Western. Today, they're linked by air with regular services operating from the International Airport near the capital of American Samoa, Pango Pango. So let's fly to explore the delights of the other island. Oh, yes, let's do. I, I think never, the airplane had just been invented. I never hang on Pango away with that. Are reminders of a do you hokey pokey? The tombs of the chiefs who ruled these islands before and after the white man arrived. What? What? And among the white men who lived here was one of the most famous English writers, Robert Louis Stevenson. Did he just... The people here used to call him Tusi Tala, which means teller of tales. It means old whitey. Did he just say white man? Yeah, I think it just went there. Oh, this is so old. The Samoans loved him, and although he was very ill during his last few years, he constantly fought for their rights. And before he died, he wrote this poem. <laughs> Under the wide hey, and Go get help, I'm sky, dying. <laughs> dig the grave and let me lie. They were dictating. Glad did I live and gladly die. Go Glad to the I castle, Arg. The, will. the people erected a plaque to his memory, <laughs> and they cut a road through the bush and trees to bury him on the summit of Mount Via. They called the track they made the Road of Loving Hearts. I thought it was Robert Louis home Stevenson. Is the sailor. It's now a parking garage. Home from <laughs> sea. <laughs> Reverential. And the home from the hill. Wow, that was highly inappropriate. <laughs> so, so where did you get that from? I got it from the internet. All right, well, don't give it back. Like, we're, we're gonna we're gonna burn that. The white man. Yeah, I cannot believe that. <laughs> well. <laughs> You know, it honestly, there's it's such a uh, it's such a, like this condescending colonial attitude. You know, like like you know, we're helping we're helping the Samoans help themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's, Here you go. Here's help from Whitey. We're we're gonna <laughs> there's gonna be like <laughs> records from Duna or anything okay. of the Green Men coming. Maybe maybe we should forget about our special. Thank you to our one listener in American Samoa, and we're not gonna do more tributes. Okay, we're gonna go on to our crew report now. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> So uh, these are letters from our you, listeners. You white man, you. <laughs> this one comes from Bob, 8675. I'm a mid-level Kerbal player myself, about 200 hours of game time. To fellow players, do couplers break the struts that are helping them when they fire? Meaning that 
to stabilize boosters, extra tanks, or anything else that needs to stay put for a bit, a single decoupler will do. Just use some Kerbal duct tape to keep them steady. And that was uh, whenever we were talking last week right. about uh, struts and trying to stabilize rockets because I, I was having an issue with them strapping onto decouplers. And I was having an issue remembering the word struts. <laughs> but you know what? Now I have now I have a perfect term, which is Kerbal duct tape. Right. Kerbal duct tape. It works. Yeah. It's perfect. Um, now, we did ask our question of the week last week, uh, and the question that we asked was... What are your essential mods, the mods you would not leave Kerbin without? Now, we got a response uh, from John Martin, and he said, Regarding the question of the week and mods, In the past, I found mods can destabilize a game and cause crashes, etc. That being the case, I try and avoid mods, but there is one indispensable mod for me, Kerbal Engineer Redux. Is it Redux or Redo? Redo. Is it redo? Yeah. So I have to redo this? <laughs> well, don't, uh, well, don't redux it. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me, okay, redux two. Uh, this mod will show the delta V and thrust to weight ratio of my stages and rockets in the vehicle assembly building. So I know a rocket has a good chance to get where it's going. And then he adds kind of as a postscript My son, age 11, uses Mech Jeb because the game would be too hard for him otherwise. I do not use it, however. Um, I think that's kind of cool that his son is playing the game at 11. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why don't you move on? You've got one now. Uh, this is from a regular contributor. This is somebody who's written in before, and we always welcome their submissions time and time again. This comes from Run, Phil, Run. The list of mods that they won't leave without. Infernal Robotics adds joints and motor parts. I've seen some really cool contraptions on our Kerbal Space Program using this mod. B9 Aerospace and KW Rocketry. Kerbal Attachment System, also known as KAS. KAX and Fire Spitter, which introduces propellers. Chatter, which adds a classic radio chatter, great atmosphere, and is configurable. KOS, which lets you write scripts for your rockets. Like, it's kind of like a do-it-yourself mech jab. Crowdsourced science adds diversity to the message you get when collecting science. Um, it kind of gives it a war-friendly kind of thing. KSP Mod Admin, a mod manager for installing, uninstalling, and backing up your mods without having to mess around in the game data folder. And that letter came to us from... Run, Phil, run. Okay. And you know what's interesting is we, uh, you know, we asked the question, what's the essential mods? If you'll notice, there's a lot of overlap here. Uh, we get a lot of the same people, or a lot of different people saying the same mods. Um, this comes from a, a contributor in the past, uh, Javin Shear, and he says that I use Chatterer, which is what you just yeah, mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it adds beeps and non... He said, quote, adds some beeps and nonsensical radio chatter. He also uses raster prop monitor, which this is really this is one of those mods that I would love to have, and I have yet to figure out how to install it. Yeah, because this is not one of the drag and drops. Um, but this it it makes your control panel inside the spacecraft. You get like this high tech Star Trek Next Generation display with all of this information. Wait, so it's not like the same style it no no style you know how the, the the vanilla version of the game has you know some dials and knobs yeah, and yeah. things no this is like you know this is like touch screen I'm, I'm probably not touch screen but it's like extremely detailed digital panels that's awesome yeah it's really cool and i've i've tried to install it several times and so just so y'all know i'm not exactly like um like you know the the master level player here i can't get <laughs> roster prop monitor installed um he also installed at first, I thought this was the same thing. He says he installs Hot Rockets. Hot Rockets. Hot Rockets, uh, which is new particle effects for exhaust and smoke trails. And then he says he installed Cool Rockets. Cool Rockets. Well, it's different. <laughs> this is ice falling off tanks, uh, and it works with Hot Rockets. Oh, so you could be like the you know the Iron Man suit. You solve yeah. the de-icing issue. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, uh, in Apollo 13, when uh, in the movie, when they're launching... You know how you've got all that ice raining down? Yeah, yeah. And I'm referring to a fake movie. You know how in all of the Apollo launchings, you, <laughs> the, um, you know, when somebody nudges you and go, hey, what's all that? It's ice. It's ice that is formed on around the um, uh, the, the fuel tanks. Huh. And when the rockets start vibrating, all that ice breaks loose and starts raining down. And then the last thing that Javin Shear says, that uh, last mod that he uses is Alcor, uh, which is the advanced landing capsule for orbital rendezvous. So anyway, uh, that is our crew report. Uh, well, actually, uh, since we started recording, we uh, put the question out on Twitter one more time, and we ah, have a couple right. responses there. So from 
MK thirty four twenty four. They said I literally in the year thirty four twenty. No, go ahead. I literally lost count on the mods I use and have used. Uh, the ones listed are KAS, KSO, HGR, MJ, DR, six S, and he said that's only the beginning. Yeah, and uh, he also uses uh, ASAP. Uh, he uses TMI. <laughs> uh, he B- uses BYB. B- yeah, BRB. Uh, he uses BFF. Okay, I- I've lol enough at that. Uh, <laughs> the next one comes from Brian81584. Uh, dist- oh, we got another one? Distant Objects and Eve. I have I have to have my clouds. Kerbin looks naked without them. And our most recent one came from MattBP2468. Uh, fire spitter, mostly due to the electric propellers making planes on other planets feasible. The boat parts are pretty awesome, too. So we want to thank you guys. If you ever want to put in anything to Twitter, it's at KerbalCast. And um, before we move on from Crew Report, there's one more thing that we wanted to get into. Um, The big question was, we were talking about essential mods. And in and amongst the responses we were getting, you came across something. This wasn't a response, but it was something that you came across. Yeah, it was was having to do with mods. And, you know, we're talking about essential ones. And those are ones that you find essential. But there's a mod going around that makes itself essential the one we're talking about is mod statistics and from uh forums that i read on and the original post for mod statistics uh what it pretty much is is you could download it by itself or it's inside of other mods and what it does is it tracks information so yeah you told me about this before we started recording i'd never heard of this yeah so there's there's some mods that it's already inside and uh like the Information that it's collecting is session start and end time, whether the session ended in a crash, uh, but it did not include crash details, Kerbal Space Program version, mod statistics internal version, total time spent in each scene, uh, be that the menu, tracking station, uh, you know, space center, and list of plugins detected and their versions. So as you're playing... Wait wait a minute, it collects all this and sends it back? Yeah, it sends it to, uh, like there's a source that it sends it to, Uh and it... It sends all that information. So if you if you downloaded a mod that has it, it'll it'll send that off. Now there aren't very many mods that have it yet, but um, the originator of the mod is Majir M A J I I R. Okay. And they're in hit. They're in that person's mods. Is this something that the user knows about? In some of them, uh, if they set it up front, yes. Um, now, it can be assumed since Majir made it, it's going to be in all of his mods, mo- mm-hmm. more than likely. And uh, anyone else who puts it in there, if they tell you it's in there, it's in there. Otherwise, you'd have to find it. So it's not... How do you do that? Y- you would have to go into the code. So it depends, oh. on, it depends on where they hide it. So some oh, well, of, that's easy. Yeah, some of them can make it blatant. It's like right there. And other ones, it could be hidden if they, if they really wanted it. So I don't know if other modders using it, if they could change the source it goes to and it could go to their own server that gives them the information. Now, they did want to say that uh, it, they claim that it does not uh, take any personal information. Only information from within KSP is collected and care has been taken to ensure that no other information is sent and that none of the information collected could be personally identifying. Does it ask your permission to do this or does it no, just do it? No, it is actually, it's opt out. So everybody's opted in the moment you download it. And you so you, to, oh, you're automatically opted. Yeah, you have to go. You have to go into the mod itself and remove it. Now, what? Wait a minute. You have to go into the code. Uh, it depends on where they put it. Again, so. Oh. And I'm I'm not you know. I am probably a CSI level hacker, as in I really don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, from what I've read and from the way people have been talking, that uh, it could be something as simple as just you delete a file inside the mod, mm-hmm. or if they really wanted to hide it, you would have to have like you know, coding knowledge in order to find the parts to remove it. Because what they could do, or and what has happened with mods in other games in the past, is they could put something essential in there, and if you try to remove it, it actually damages part of the game itself, not just the mod. I'm not a big fan of automatic opt-in. Yeah, I, I always like there to be the choice. Like, I'm choosing to pick the mod, and whenever you put the mod on there, I'm choosing to take that one itself. Right, but if you put in something else, I'm not. I wasn't choosing that. You know, it's. I mean, really, it could be a bait and switch on a lot of things, depending mm-hmm. on the kind of information they're getting. And they say the information's harmless, but while Majir may not have uh, much in mind for that information, just session times and whether things crash due to the mod or due to the whatever. That that is 
you know, the information he's going for, but somebody could take it and get it to collect any other information. And I'm not saying this is going to be a world ending kind of thing, but it's kind of how we were talking in a previous episode about cheating and, you know, right. you, you need to list all your mods as a courtesy to other players. Mm -hmm. I think it's also, you know, a courtesy of the modders to list what is in their mod. So you could have something that just kind of sneaks its way in. You know, even if it's not personal information, I, I still don't like the fact that it's doing this without asking you and that you have to, instead of opt in, you have to opt out. Yeah, yeah, it's it's basically doing, <laughs> it's kind of like how like Facebook's terms agreements will you know change and then all of a sudden everything that was set to private, set to public, and you have to go change it back. Right. You have to go change it back. So now... <laughs> it's you have to like tread lightly when you're looking for mods uh -huh. if you want to avoid something like that because while Majir may not have any ill intent with it uh, somebody somebody could take something like that and make it to where it could be a problem not so much to where it's getting sensitive data but if you try to remove it it won't go away or it'll harm your game if you do and I guess because it's part of Kerbal it goes right if you have your firewall set um, to let Kerbal pass through this would go through as well uh, I guess so. I yeah, would, I, I, I didn't even think of that, but yeah, it would do something like that. And they've had uh, problems with other mods in the past. Like there were mods for Minecraft mm -hmm. that if you tried to delete the mod, it would take part of the game with it. So uh, there was one that if you deleted the mod, uh, somebody noticed anytime lightning struck, their game crashed because it took part of the lightning code with it. Okay. So yeah, it. I'm you know I'm I'm curious what listeners of the podcast think about this. This. This isn't the big question of the week, but um, if you have an opinion uh, on on this, it's called Mod Statistics. Mod Statistics. If you have an opinion on this, uh, and... Um, like, what do you think it is now, or where do you think it could go? Well, and, and also, just do you like the fact that, that this is inside of other mods that you download and may not know it's there? Do you like the fact... Or do you dislike the fact that it's collecting information, regardless of how harmless, and sending it back? Um, I, I, please write us on this one. I would love to hear from you. Um, I, I'd love to kind of hear opinions. Uh, our email is kerbalpodcast at gmail.com. And now we've reached the point in the podcast where it's time for mission briefing. This is uh, news related to Kerbal and also uh, space and science in general. And uh, our first story uh, comes to us from the website iflscience.com. Uh, HP Hewlett Packard has introduced what they call the machine. The machine. The machine. It uses clusters of specialized cores as opposed to a small number of generalized cores. The whole thing is connected together using silicon photonics instead of traditional copper wires, which boosts the speed of the system while reducing energy requirements. Furthermore, the technology features what they call mem restores, which are resistors that are able to store information even after power loss. Uh, the result is a system that is six times more powerful than existing machines that requires 80 times less energy. Well, 80 times less. Yes. According to HP, the machine can manage 160 petabytes of data in a mere 250 nanoseconds. And what's more, this is not meant for huge supercomputers. It can be used in small devices like smartphones and laptops. Wow. Yeah, they said um, the machine will not surface, or the first devices equipped with the machine won't surface in tw until uh, 2018. But this is something you can start uh, licking your lips over. Yeah, like like saving up you know, all your Christmas money. Every you know, day. What, what amazes me about this is how quickly uh computer technology advances yeah it just it's like exponentially ramping up about three years ago uh i built a desktop computer and um i you know i went through and i got the most high powered motherboard i could find you know the biggest graphics card fastest ram i mean i did everything i you yeah know, i stuck in the fastest processor and when i got it there wasn't a, a game out there that that it couldn't handle without even sweating you know it was like lifting weights with one hand and you know 
doing something else with the other that would be equally strong. I, I, I went blank on it <laughs> anyway. But um, but now three years later, um, that same system is it has slowed down relative to the new stuff that's out there. Yeah. Um, I actually uh, what I've done since I got a I got a gaming laptop um, back in February. And so what I did was I actually, uh, my desktop, I've converted over to Linux now. Uh, I'm using Ubuntu. And the reason I did that is, you know, Kerbal has a Linux version of the game that you can get through Steam. Isn't it running at 64? And it's 64. Yeah, yeah. 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 The drivers for my graphics card uh, are generic in Linux. I can't find any that are specific to that graphics card. Uh-huh. So the graphics are very basic. You know, there's 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 certainly not going to win any awards. But the thing that I have noticed, um, whereas my desktop used to chug on Kerbal as far as handling all the physics and everything of the game, now that I'm running the Linux version of it on my desktop, it runs, and I'm talking performance, not graphics, but the uh, it runs performance-wise comparable to my brand-new gaming laptop. So it makes mm. a difference. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still kind of learning my way through Ubuntu. Uh, <laughs> if anyone's had any experience, we'd love to hear from you with that. Uh, let's see. What else do we have for news? From the Globe and Mail, initial results from a study of Chris Hadfield and other astronauts who spent months aboard the International Space Station have turned up changes like those seen in someone developing type 2 diabetes on Earth. In the confined zero-g environment of the space station, astronauts experience almost none of the daily physical demands required by normal life on the ground. Researchers have observed elevated levels of insulin and other blood-related factors in four astronauts, though none have diabetes symptoms. The preliminary findings suggest that an increase in blood sugar due to inactivity could play a role in stiffening arteries. About 20% of astronauts experience a swelling of the optic nerves, leading to a farsightedness while in space. What I thought was interesting about that story, do you remember a couple episodes back we talked about uh, the possibility of getting to Mars? Yeah, the Elon Musk story. Yeah, and uh, and th- we had made the comment at the time that there were some challenges that they were going to have to get past, and one of them was that, which is the human body in in a weightless environment starts to undergo dramatic changes. Yeah. You, you lose muscle mass, you lose bone density. Um and that that story ties into that. If we're ever going to live on Mars or live in space or whatever, we've got to figure out how to make the human body compatible with weightlessness. Yeah, especially uh whenever they're talking about a one way trip to Mars. Like yeah. those that's like years that right. you would be existing in that environment. Right. And I mean the most they've been going off of is months. There was um I read years ago, I was reading a book about the uh, the Russian space program, and I remember reading at the time, they said that after about three months, the effects of weightlessness start to level out. And I spent today, I spent some time today trying to hunt that factoid down, and I was not able to do so. Yeah. But I, I remember... I'm pretty sure I remember reading that after about three months, these effects start to um, flatten out. Like, I, d- I don't know if that's... Like, just become accustomed to the environment? Well, the, the deterioration flattens, and oh, okay. it plateaus. Yeah, because you're still using your muscles and stuff yeah. to a certain extent. Just... Understand, this is like, I read this book like 10 or 12 years ago. <laughs> but, I mean, I do remember they said that, that um, the um, experiment, uh, the experiences they had with long-term... Uh, stays on the Russian Mir space station. Yeah. Um, if I remember, I think I think if I'm not mistaken, I think they set the record. It was like more than one year for one person continuously on the Mir. Oh, okay. But um, but you know they they did a lot of research on long term weightlessness. Yeah. It's a and lot of, a lot of info to go. Off yeah. Of. Um, I'm. I would love. To, I wish I could find that. But uh, the reason that we tossed that story in was we thought that that related well back to the Mars thing. So, okay, Uh, we're going to go from Mars to the moon now. Um, Something that I was completely unaware of. Do you know that the, I'm not calling it the dark side of the moon because that's wrong. Yeah. The far side of the moon. Uh Uh-huh. Do you know that the far side of the moon and the near side of the moon are different geographically? 
Like, isn't one just, like, covered in more craters or something? Yeah, it's called, uh, it's what they call the Lunar Farside Highlands Problem. Uh, and, uh, again, this is uh, this also comes from the IFLScience.com website. There is um, a theory as to what this is. It says, quote, it's long been known that the absence of the basaltic plains that we call Maria, or seas, is a result of the crust being thicker on the far side, but it's unclear whether this greater, greater thickness on the side away from the Earth was a coincidence. Um, the moon was formed, the, the theory is, is that it was formed out of debris uh, that was thrown up into, into uh, orbit when an object the size of Mars collided with the Earth. Uh, the theory is that the moon initially lay, uh, was much closer to Earth ensuring that it was more affected by our gravity. And because of that, um, it rapidly entered what they called synchronous rotation, where one side always faces the object that it's orbiting, which is, and that's why we always get the same face of the moon yeah. facing us. Even though the moon is rotating, it's rotating in a synchronous orbit. Oh, yeah, so the degree it's rotating stays yeah. where it's yeah. always it always We always have the same face of the moon. But anyway, the... The uh, theory is now that's been put out there, they say, quote, the smaller moon would have cooled uh, while the Earth remained hot from the collision. For the side of the moon facing the Earth, it would be like having two suns. The second one, cooler and smaller, but also much closer. In other words, the Earth. So two sources of heat. As a result, the side facing the Earth would have cooled more slowly than that facing towards outer space. And as a result of that, when asteroids struck the moon's near side, lava flowed to fill in the spaces. But on the far side, the thicker crust almost always prevented lava from flowing, which is why you don't have the Maria. And I hit the mic again. Have you noticed that is every podcast I hit the mic at some point? It's it's like the hidden Easter egg now. (laughs) At what point does Biff hit the mic? But anyway, I thought that was a really interesting story. I'm, I'm kind of a moon nut. And I was I was unaware that there was the difference between the two. Yeah. So, what's our next story? This one was actually sent to us by a listener, Caleb. Uh, the International Space Station is getting its first ever espresso machine. The Italian Space Agency, of course, is the Italian Space Agency. The Italian <laughs> Space Agency is about to make of life course. in the International Space Station a lot more comfortable. This November, it'll send up the first espresso machine to the station, calling the machine ISS Espresso. The espresso. Yeah, this won't be the first presence of coffee on the ISS, but it'll sure beat the instant stuff that they've been bringing up in the past. You know, not to be gross, but espresso kind of cleans me out. So I hope the <laughs> ISS. I hope the ISS potties are working really yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love the fact that this is the Italian Space Agency. Yeah, it's actually it's being uh, sent up with their. Um, Italian astronaut who's going to be going up right. for the for the first Italian one. Well, in space. you know, Italians are known worldwide as as great cooks, as great connoisseurs. Yeah, you know, so the idea that they're sending up if we're going to space, we're taking an espresso yeah, machine. We're taking coffee with us. You know, I, I just I, I love that. It's like you know, okay, you know, this guy over here, he's bringing all this high tech stuff. I'm bringing the coffee machine. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind of like whenever it's your, like your freshman year in college and yeah. you're talking to your dorm mate. Hey, do you have the microwave? Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to bring the espresso. Yeah, you're my new best friend. <laughs> All right, and Caleb, we want to thank you for sending in the story. And uh, let's see, that was from the website. The, the source was theverge.com. Okay, uh, let's see. Next to last story. Um, this is one that, that I am just really fascinated with. You know, the, you know what the New Horizons uh, space probe is? This is something that NASA launched uh, a while back, and it's taken it this long. Uh, it, it won't it won't actually get there until July of next year. But the new missions uh, is actually going to be the first spacecraft to get close enough to Pluto to take high resolution photographs. Oh, because right now, if you try and look at pictures of Pluto, what you get is a lot of blob. Yeah. Um, what they're doing is, uh, as new missions, the space probe is on its way. Um, they are using the Hubble telescope, or they have recommended that they should use the Hubble telescope this way, uh, to search the area that Pluto is in, known as the Kuiper Belt. And what they're wanting it to do, what they want the Hubble to do, is find other targets 
that the New Horizons space probe can investigate once it's done with Pluto. The, the whole Pluto thing just fascinates me, and the idea that, uh, that, that we've got a spacecraft going out there. It's like, you know, come on, July 2015, yeah. come on. All right, uh, our last story uh, is actually a developer update from Harvester, uh, which, as we all know, is the uh, game creator, Felipe. And what does he say? Okay, so some of the changes being made in the new update is being required to purchase your vessels before you launch and being rewarded for the things you achieve. And they said that will add a whole new dimension to the game because they said that uh, contracts and budgets, while not completely linked, they kind of have to be in there together in order yeah. to uh, to make a good update. And What good is money if you can't spend it? Yeah. Um, they said that we're now looking, albeit still a couple of updates away, at scope completion. If you're wondering what scope completion means... It means that every major gameplay system in the game is implemented, even if the content is limited or uh, just it doesn't have a very large presence. But they're just going to work on all those parts that are in the game until they're fully developed. Reaching scope completion does not mean, of course, that they're done with the game. It just means that there aren't going to be any new major features coming in. That's cool. I'm, I am anxiously awaiting uh, the, uh, the contracts and the budget system. The more I'm learning about it, the more excited I am. When I first heard about it, I thought, you know, eh, it's going to take away from the core that I like about the game. Yeah. But the more I'm hearing about it, the more I'm liking it. And they said that, like, this update is kind of the big uh, last part of the home stretch for contracts and budgets. Right, right. Okay, well, that wraps it up for uh, our mission briefing, our, our news. And, of course, you know what that means. And now, another edition of As the Curbin Turns. Honey, I'm home. Hello, dear. How was your day? Oh, same as always. The onboard computer went crazy, and I got sucked into some kind of star portal. Say, who's that old guy standing in the corner? He kind of looks like me. Tune in next time for another edition of As the Turban Turns. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. But we, I, I don't get it. There's a, you know, he, he's having a guest over. I don't, I don't get it. It's a soap opera. It's a long lost. You make any sense like, to me? Like long lost father. You're like no memories or anything. Where was all the blood and guts? <laughs> Come on. I just, just, just give. I it don't a shot. like this high concept inside joke stuff. It'll, it'll, it'll come back around. It'll come back around. It's in low orbit. It'll be, it'll be violent and bloody mm-hmm. next week. It's in low orbit. It'll okay. crash. Okay. Okay. Well, what are we moving on to now? We're moving on to But I Digress, which is our segment where we talk about things that are non-curbal, but we still try to keep it space-related. So the movie that we're talking about today is Solaris. Yes. And this is, um, we actually mentioned, do you remember last podcast we had the question, what do you listen to while you play Kerbal? Yeah. And that's where you came out with, you know, Bloody Diarrhea or whatever no. the name of that band was. <laughs> Diarrhea Planet. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know what? I love the fact that... that because you, you said that you listen to different things during different stages of the game. Yeah. I love the fact that when you're, that you listen to Diarrhea Planet when you launch. Yeah, when you're blasting off. Yeah, yeah. The idea that, you know, I, I never thought I would hear the words launch and diarrhea in the same, in the same sentence. And they wouldn't be completely related, yeah. directly related. But I did mention that the soundtrack to this movie, uh, I, I have a tendency to put it on repeat, and just hours later, it's like, hey, that's still playing. Yeah, it had a good soundtrack. Yeah, it's really good. It's Especially when you listen to it, it's very ambient. Oh, just to throw in, I watched this movie right before I got here, so <laughs> all the info is new. Well, this is uh, this movie uh, stars George Clooney, and uh, obviously there's going to be lots of spoilers, so uh, if you have not seen the movie, uh, uh, you might want to skip over this part. Go ahead and skip ahead about 18 minutes, and you should be straight into the question. Let me give you the um, plot synopsis, and this is, this is cribbed from IMDb, okay? Um, the story plot, uh, the plot of the, uh, the movie, a psychologist, Dr. Chris Kelvin, is sent to a space station orbiting the planet Solaris to find out what has caused the crew to seemingly go insane. Uh, this is based on a novel by the Russian author Stanislaw Lem. Uh, it is a remake of a Russian film that was actually four hours long. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. And occasionally it will pop up on Turner Classic Movies. Uh, I have yet to sit through it. I have read the book. Okay. But I have not seen the original movie. Uh, but this version stars George Clooney as uh, Chris Kelvin. 
and uh, Natasha McElhenney as uh, as his wife Rhea. Um, very, I enjoy this movie a lot, and I thought thematically it would be a good follow up to last week where we talked about gravity. And the reason I thought that is is both of these movies, even though they end up in different places. Okay, this is where we're starting to get in the spoilers. So if you didn't learn your lesson, skip ahead. Yeah, um, both movies end up in different places, but they both start in the same place, which is characters that are essentially dead. Characters that have yeah. given up on life. Because if you'll notice, George Clooney, the, his character has different stages throughout the film. Um, when you first meet him, uh, the man is, is just dead to the world. He's deadened. He's numb from tragedy. Uh, then he becomes more desperate and frantic. That's At first, you don't see a whole lot of emotion. Then you start to see almost extreme emotion. Like everything's coming back. Right. And then towards the end, you get more of the you know, happier character. Yeah. So, as you said, you just saw the film. What are your thoughts? Okay. So, um, I kind of marathoned through it, and I, I really like it. It's a very mm -hmm. good film. Um, I didn't... Uh, I'm going to have to do another viewing to fully, you know, to see if I catch any things or mm -hmm. any certain things like that. But and you will. I, I'm going to give it another viewing. It, it was it was really good. Um, I thought it was uh, really interesting how they, you know, they go back to these certain discussions that happen in the background, like, um, you know, everybody attributes God to being like them. You mm -hmm. know, they, they start to put all these human things onto God. Right. You know, like uh, creating, you know, like having these goals and you know just putting all these things that we think you know a good human would do that's what god is or does you know he creates he creates things so like so that's, that's what he is that's what he does and then uh there are multiple times where uh he'll question something and they'll tell him like you're you know essentially you're trying to make it fit into your reasoning and logic. Right. And that's not, yeah, you, not going to work. You're taking a conclusion and trying to make it fit. Yeah. Instead of letting letting the evidence lead you to a conclusion. Yeah, like... You're um, working backwards from a conclusion. Okay, this is the point where we're going to turn the spoilers up to 11. If you have not skipped ahead and you want to miss something and you want to skip, now's the time because here it comes. Um what happens? They they send his Dr. Chris Kelvin. Uh, his wife had committed suicide years earlier. He gets a message from a friend of his who is on the station, and the, the friend basically says, you're the only person that can understand what's going on here. You need to come out. So they send him out. He gets to the station. Everybody is dead except for two crew members. Um, and he says what's going on and they say you're not you you have to experience it before you understand it he goes to sleep the first night and when he wakes up his wife is there and and really at that point i was like i had to reiterate to myself I was like wait isn't she yeah oh okay yeah if you would try to explain that to me when i was there i wouldn't have gotten it either and they don't really explain how this happens i mean there's a lot of hints but what they lean towards is, is that Solaris, the planet itself, has some kind of a consciousness. And it reads your mind or it reads your dreams and it manifests in reality what you're dreaming about. Yeah. Um, and you have, for example, the friend that had asked him to come out. Uh, his son is running around the station. Uh, one of the two remaining crew members has somebody in her cabin. You never find out who it is, but it is somebody that Solaris has created for her. Um, what I thought was real, um, the, the reason that I keep going back to this movie is it really deals with the question of identity. Um, I wanted to ask you, Kelvin's wife's name was Rhea. And she shows up the morning after his first night. Yeah. Was that really Rhea? That showed up the first time? 
Yeah, the the uh, yeah the okay another spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> she shows up twice. Um, the first time she shows up, he actually sends her away. He sticks her in a capsule and 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 launches it. Um, but the Rhea that shows up either time is that really her? I think uh, she was closer than what uh, the second one. So it, it's it's kind of like a the co- first one. Was closer yeah. than the second one. Yeah, to to the original. It's kind of like when you're copying data; mm-hmm. it just it deteriorates over time. Did you notice the difference? The first dream that he had about his wife was about how they met, and she was yeah. she was happy and she was very confident. And the one that appeared to him the next morning was happy and confident. Yeah, and so the one that he got mostly later on. mostly, but then the one when he met when the second one came his dream had been more about the fact that she had been plagued by depression. And mm-hmm. so that one, like the deterioration of the relationship. And, right. And it's outcomes, a more um, fragile and damaged person. The reason I ask, was that really Rhea boils down to this. There are some scenes where she is remembering things from their past. And most of it is from his point of view. So the idea that she was created from his memories fits. But some of her memories occurred when he wasn't there. Now, it may have been stuff that he imagined, but that raises the question, is she a construct of his memory? Yeah. Or is there some kind of, you know, Rhea soul or Rhea you know, energy out there in the universe that, that came into this body. I think, um, (laughs) this is, this is, this is a fun conversation. (laughs) I think that, um, the first her was so close to like the essence of her that Mm -hmm. it was able to start piecing together. Like, okay, you know, if I was like this or this, it's kind of like picturing yourself in a situation, you know, Mm -hmm. your behaviors, you know, that. So, it was able to piece together some memories from that saying like, well, okay, you know, and it was finding itself because it was Rhea without a heavy presence of ego or a heavy presence of, um, you know, the things that were causing damage to her internally, you know? So without those, she was like closer to finding, and he was closer to finding her, like her true self. Now, as, uh, you know, she went away and then the new one came, you ran into the problem that the things he was fixating on is the last thing he did to her on on the space station was like a hard damaging thing so that's right. going to carry over into his dreams and she carries over into that and you know that's a good point i had never thought of that but you're absolutely right yeah so what he was thinking about was all the all the you know, kind of the bad times it's like per- mm-hmm. persuading yourself out of a break or right. into a breakup because they're like well remember it wasn't all you know like happy times and roses, like there were some bad parts. Mm-hmm. So he fixated on that, and it's it's perception is reality is a huge part of the movie. So if you continually focus on the negative traits of a person, they will become the monster you perceive them to be. Mm-hmm. But if you see the goodness in them, or you know the the person that they can be, you'll see how great they are, and like it fills in a lot of gaps of whatever you question what you learn as the movie progresses is that um, their relationship was deteriorating uh, and somewhere in there she discovered she was pregnant and rather than tell him she went and aborted the baby when he found out he had a tantrum for the ages and stormed out and she was pleading with him saying don't leave i won't make it without you and the last thing he ever said to her was then you won't make it and he leaves Mm -hmm. and then he comes back later and she's overdosed and and he finds her corpse yeah and the kelvin that we meet at the beginning of the movie is somebody who is so haunted by guilt and by tragedy and this movie gives him a chance, and it also raises the question, what would you do if you had a second chance to undo some of your regrets? And his behavior becomes increasingly more extreme. One of my favorite lines in the film, um, he has locked himself in his cabin with her, and she is arguing with him, 
we can't live like this. What kind of a life is this? And he says, quote, it's what we have. Oh, it was it was really interesting because they, they tell him at one point, um, you know, she says, this is inevitable. It's going to happen. And, and he keeps saying, no, we can change it. This is right. a second chance. Whenever what he's doing is he's doing what he's been doing the entire time. He's not letting go. Like, this could be a second chance to make peace and let go. Mm-hmm. But he's making it a second chance to keep holding on and not move on. Right. So, now, the way the movie ends um, is the station, for reasons I won't get into, but the station uh, adds or gains a great deal of mass. And so what happens is it, it, it literally falls out of orbit into the planet Solaris. And earlier they had made the comment, um, um, Rhea did, the wife, had said, you know, we can't live like this, we can't go back to Earth like this. She made the comment that um, maybe, you know, if we could ever find a way to live inside of our love, maybe that would be an answer. Yeah. And at the end of the movie... Um, he's back in his apartment and she's alive and he's back on earth, although it's not really. And he says to her, am I alive or am I dead? And she says, we don't have to think like that anymore. And that's the end of the movie. And it, it kind of goes back to, you know, you you keep putting all these human concepts on greater than human right. things. You know, you, you keep trying to set it into, well, am I alive or dead? Well, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, my understanding of the ending um, and it's open to interpretation, but my understanding is is that whatever his life essence, whatever his consciousness, whatever he was, somehow or the other merged or joined with or became part of whatever Solaris was. And the idea is is that he has finally undone that big mistake. But here's the question I have for you. Is that really a happy ending? Do they really live happily ever after? No. It's kind of like living in the... It's kind of like taking the dream state. You yeah. Know? yeah. Uh, if you if you accept that, then you didn't really move on. Right. And I understand that, yeah, it is painful and it is not easy. But if you just, like, whatever makes the pain go away, I'll take that. It's like, mm-hmm. when really you should accept the pain and accept how things are and you know you can acknowledge it and you can feel it but don't let it control you and don't let it rule your life and you can move on well the other thing and this goes back to what i said earlier is it really Rhea? um if it is not really her then even if it may be a happily ever after for him it wasn't for her he may have he may have gotten to undo his big mistake but she still, the real Rhea, is still dead from suicide, and he still left her. Uh huh. And also, the other question I have is, how complete is this world that they find themselves in? You know, she made the comment about living inside of our love. Well, are they going to spend eternity or however long basically sitting around moon, making moony eyes at each other? Yeah. Or, or have they literally recreated his life inside of Solaris? In other words, is he still going to go to work, and is he still going to interact with other people? And, you know, just the, the happily ever after, the more you dig into it, the more you get a question mark at the end of it. Yeah, the, the thing that what I considered Solaris to be was an entity that didn't know humanity, mm-hmm. but it knew, um, like essence and purity yeah. and so whenever it was making contact with the human it was it was giving him what they were dreaming about what they aspired right. to and and it was also saying be careful what you wish for yeah i i don't think it, it had like a innocence to it like mm-hmm. it was this beautiful planet and every time you saw it you're like man it's just really pretty and it hadn't really experienced um you know corruption well i don't think it had an intent one way or the other i think it just kind of you know it was there yeah and because at one point uh in one of his dreams the friend who had asked kelvin to come to the station appears to him in the dream and it's it's essentially the man behind the curtain it's the wizard of oz yeah communicating directly with him but what he what he is saying to him is you need to get out of here or you're in trouble because 
this wish fulfillment stuff the siren, is gonna yeah, yeah it's gonna take you to a bad place yeah the siren song of solaris yeah yeah uh, you know there's no strapping you to the mast for this one yeah so anyway uh it's solaris is a film that did not do well at the box office um it does not have uh very good reviews Part of the problem is the way they advertised it. Uh, they advertised it as it was like a space adventure film. Kind of, kind of like it would. It probably had advertising that made it look more like Gravity. Yeah, and well, they and it, and it looked exciting, and yeah, you know, and you know, so the crowd that thought that they were going to get a, a exciting space adventure sat through two hours of this very quiet, contemplative film, and the crowd that would have appreciated that didn't go because they thought it was going to be Armageddon. Yeah. Starring George Clooney. <laughs> and this one, this was around 2002, so that's whenever a lot yeah. of, like, you know, good mind-bendery kind of movies really started. Yeah. Like, things like The Matrix and, you know, all these things that really were like, hey, let's let's question, you know, concepts. Like, okay. you had uh, Equilibrium, which I'm not going to tout as one of the best movies ever, but <laughs> it, it says, you know, the, the presence of emotion and right. is subverting it the answer. And then you you know, you go into Solaris and it's it starts to see like what you don't you don't always get what you wish for and what you wish for may not be what you actually want. Right. This is a very underrated movie. If you have not seen it uh, and if you've stayed with us this long, um, I highly recommend it. You know, understand it is a it, it is a fairly targeted movie, but I think it is one of George Clooney's best performances. Um, the nuances that you see in that character as the story develops um i I really do think that that he underplays it so well and he conveys so much in so many scenes where he doesn't say a word and i also want to say that uh that natasha mckelleny as raya uh does an extremely good job as well she plays all facets of the character a very very well-rounded performance from both uh, George Clooney and Natasha McElhenney. So anyway, it's called Solaris. Uh, very good movie. I strongly recommend it. And I guess that wraps it up for But I Digress. Yes, it does. <laughs> Why not? Okay, so uh, now we're going to move on to our question. This is our question. You can email us, kerbalpodcast at gmail.com, or you can answer it through Twitter at Kerbalcast. So the question for this week is, they made a mod for the World Cup. Squad actually made this mod. To where they put in giant soccer balls and like uh, you know a couple other things so you could play soccer. So and from everything I've seen, it actually looks pretty cool. Like some yeah. people have made like uh, landing systems out of soccer balls where it just bounces. <laughs> Somebody made a robot and yeah. it like runs around and kicks soccer balls. And this it's we crazy. We are the robot. <laughs> so uh, our question for this week is: What other major events would you like to see mods of? Yeah, because remember, Kerbal also did the asteroid redirect mission, which is an event that's coming up. Yeah. So th- they have a tendency to do mods that are keyed off of actual real world events. Yeah. So what events do you want to see and what would you like the mod to have? So, I mean, everybody's pumped about Arbor day so we could finally have trees on Kerbin. <laughs> so you could get the Arbor day mod. <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, they already have the groundhog day mod. Yeah. We yeah. just revert and keep launching just over and keep over. messing up and <laughs> reverting back to quick launch. Um, If you want to uh, answer our big question, uh, just send us an email. Uh, It is kerbalpodcast at gmail.com. As always, uh, you can send us a text email. Or if you'd like, uh, record yourself and send us an MP3. And uh, we'd love to play uh, the audio of you actually reading your letter yourself. Uh, You can also answer us on Twitter. At Kerbalcast. I can't believe that this is episode number six. Yeah, we've, we've done six of these. Got a good, got a good streak going. Yeah, there you go. You know what though? After seven, it's all downhill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, eight, eight. Let's make it eight. Oh, we'll After make eight, it eight. It's all downhill. Okay, okay. We do want to, as always, uh, thank the listeners, uh, everybody who has downloaded this podcast, uh, everybody who's listened. Thank you so much. Uh, we uh, we love hearing from you. Uh, we love. Uh, reading comments on iTunes, uh, and we do uh, also want to thank the folks at Squad uh, who have been a big help for us on this podcast. We want to thank the uh, moderators at the subreddits. Uh, it's Kerbal Space Program. Don't forget there's another one. It is Kerbal Academy, and then there is KSP Testing. Uh, all of those uh, are real good subreddits. Be sure and subscribe. Uh, you'll find a link to us on the front page of Kerbal Space Program on Reddit. 
Uh, also, uh, big thanks to the uh, person who provides our music. Professor Soap. You can find him at Facebook.com slash Professor Soap. And so until next time, I'm your LMP, that's Lunar Module Pilot, Biff Aldrin, and our CMP, that's Command Module Pilot, Nostromo. In the meantime, happy, happy kerbling. kerbling! Hello, dear. How was your day? Oh, same as always. The onboard computer went crazy. No, it didn't. We're no, fine. It no, it didn't. I don't have any problems. That was a great day. Oh, same as always. The encore. Yeah. The rap, the rap, the rap, the rap. You spit into the mic. <laughs> oh, same as always. Oh, sorry. sorry. You might have, yeah. But, and not so much of a pause between crazy and I got sucked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I meant. We have letters from you guys thank uh, everybody who listens to this podcast and download uh, down the uh, nah, and we would like to thank everybody who can speak properly which does not include me none of the daily physical demands required by required researchers observed elevated levels of insulin and other blood related factors in the four astronauts though none have diabetes sensitive do you want me to read this no I, I'm gonna do this <laughs> You've set your mind to it. Should I just restart it, the whole thing?